Welcome back to the workshop. Today we're talking about the back of the bow and clearing up all your questions about backings and chasing growth rings. How do you make the back of the bow safe under tension? Throughout human history, we've solved the problem in a number of different ways. In each chapter in today's video, I'll cover one such approach to making a strong back, as well as modern and historical examples of each type. And finally, in the last chapter, I'll walk you through this decision tree so you can figure out what to do with your own stave. What unites all these methods is that they're different ways of getting straight fibers all the way through the back with as few interruptions as possible. Chapter 1. A Natural Back With most wood species, you actually don't have to chase a growth ring. You can just use the underbark surface of the tree for the back of your bow. Nature's basically already chased a growth ring for you. If you use a white wood and there isn't any damage to the outside of the tree, then chasing a growth ring is a waste of time. Just take off the outer bark and the inner bark, and beneath that is the back of your bow. In the spring and summertime when the sap is running, you can just peel off the bark all at once and you'll get a pristine, unviolated back. No need to carefully shave off the bark. Most species of bowwood fall into this bucket we call the whitewoods, as opposed to the hardwoods. The whitewoods tend to be mostly sapwood, perishable, fairly tension-strong woods. Examples include ash, elm, hickory, hazel, hornbeam, etc. The heartwoods, on the other hand, are either mostly heartwood or have heartwood that's more prized as bow-making material. Examples include osage, mulberry, locust, and laburnum. There are also many woods that fall in between the two categories. For example, oak can be treated as either a whitewood or a heartwood. For bow-making purposes, there are only two layers of bark that you need to worry about, the outer bark and the inner bark. First, scrape the crust off of the outer bark, and then take off the rest of the outer bark. This should leave you with a thick, soft, and corky layer of inner bark. Thin it out a bit without nicking the wood. You need to be very careful not to damage the first layer of wood, since it will make up the back of your bow. If you're worried about taking off the bark with a draw knife without damaging the wood, just cut the stave in the summer when the sap is flowing. The bark will peel right off. If you have winter cut wood where the bark is stuck, you can also steam the stave or throw it in a hot shower, and the bark should come off just like it's summer. For now we're done, but once the stave begins to emerge into a bow, I'll gently remove the rest of the inner bark with a scraper. You can do this now if you'd like, but I prefer to keep the inner bark on the bow during the construction because it protects the back from scratches and dings during the heavy work. You can either remove all of the inner bark or leave on thin little bits of it for an attractive camouflage-like pattern. That's totally up to you, just don't leave thick pieces of inner bark on the bow because they're likely to crack off and ruin your finish. Before we move on to the next chapter, let me just reiterate that if you don't want to carefully shave off the bark with a draw knife, you absolutely don't have to. Just cut the wood in the summertime when the sap is flowing. The bark will peel right off. If your bark is stuck, you can also throw the stave in a hot shower, or steam it, or pour some boiling water onto the bark, and it should peel off just like it's summer. No need to carefully shave that bark. Chapter 2. Chasing a Growth Ring Let's start with an example. Thank you. 
Each growth ring can be subdivided into a smaller ring of early wood and one of late wood. The early wood is porous, crunchy, and grows in the early part of the growing season. The late wood is solid and feels smooth and silky when you carve into it, compared to the crunch of the early wood. We want to make the back an entire solid late wood ring, while damaging that ring as little as possible. Make sure that if you chase a growth ring, you actually have to. If the stave already has an unbroken late wood ring across the back, you're good to go, and you should just use a natural back like in the previous chapter. Chasing a growth ring should be reserved for those situations where the back of the stave is damaged, or for woods where the heartwood is more desirable, such as osage, locust, and mulberry. Now that said, even for those woods, you don't strictly have to chase a growth ring 100% of the time. For example, if the sapwood on osage isn't rotten, and it's been well dried, then it can be used for the back of the bow. The task is to follow a crunchy early wood ring all the way through the stave. Once you're all the way across, that crunchy layer can easily be scraped off, revealing the solid late wood ring that was actually the target. It's very easy to get stumped here. When you're in doubt, try varying the angle of your light source. Low angle light can really help make sense of things when you're confused. On this particular piece, the wide rusty colored strips are the late wood. That's the solid stuff you want to make the back of your bow. The thinner orange colored rings are your early wood. That's the stuff you want to chase and then later scrape away to reveal the late wood for your back. It's also easy to get confused by these smaller lines called lunar rings. Those aren't actual growth rings, but they may trick you into thinking that they are. Keep in mind that you may see them or you may not. Try not to get thrown off if you do. It is easier to see them in a cross section. Let me show you here. First, you need to identify your target growth ring. There are a lot of things that go into this consideration. You might choose the easiest, you might choose the one that looks the biggest or the strongest. Just look at the end grain and pick one, and try to trace it all the way down the side of the stave, making sure it goes from end to end. If it runs off the back, you won't be able to chase that ring. At this point, you want to remove all of the high rings above your target growth ring, without damaging that ring, and especially not damaging any rings below it. Once you have your target ring traced out, identify all the scrap pieces of wood, in other words, all of the growth rings that are above it. I'm going to call those the high rings. You can also use this simple test to verify if a ring is above or below. Sometimes it's hard to tell. When you're carving on the frontier between two rings, if the frontier keeps moving ahead of your knife, you're on the right path and you're removing higher up growth rings. If you notice the frontier go in the other direction, if it goes behind your knife, this means you just gouged into a lower down growth ring. Stop as soon as possible. The earlier you notice this, the sooner you can stop making the problem worse. Once you get all the way across a single crunchy early wood ring, you can be done for now. You can either remove the crunchy layer now, or save it for later in the process, to keep the back from getting scratched during the rough work. Taking off the crunchy layer is easily done with a scraper. Tool choice is a slightly contentious issue when it comes to draw knives. Some bowyers prefer a dull draw knife for ring chasing, and others a sharp one. There are advantages to both. Dull knives are incredible for controlled splitting and situations where you want to go with the grain. If you're having trouble with a sharp knife digging into spots where it's not welcome, then give a dull knife a try and you'll have an easier time following the contours of the wood without nicking it. Personally, I like to use as sharp a knife as I can get away with. The advantage of a sharp knife is that you don't have to apply as much force to make the same cut. When it comes to knots, you have to be very careful to follow the contours of the fibers. You can't just carve through them as if they aren't there because that'll really weaken your bow and it'll sever the fibers on the back. Personally, I like to work against the grain, uphill into the knot, which helps follow those fibers. But you have to have a gentle hand with this method and you can't just blow through the knot. As much as you can, it's also very helpful to split and peel away knots rather than carving them, 
which will do a lot of the following the fibers work for you. A dull screwdriver that's been rounded over is really handy for this task, for the same reason that a dull draw knife is useful. It lets you follow the contours of the fibers without cutting them. Another way to deal with knots and little pin knots is to scrape your way around them. This can be slightly more tedious, but it is a lot safer, so it's a great method. One other use case for ring chasing that I haven't mentioned is using the inner splits of belly staves. There's a real big hickory stave where the waist would be big enough to make a bow out of. The only problem is that splitting will violate the fibers on the outside of the inner stave, so we can rescue it by chasing a growth ring. Chapter 3, the wood selection approach, or the board bow method. With this method, all you have to do is pick the right board, and your back will be established for you. Choose a straight grain board with little runoff and fibers that go all the way across the back, from end to end, with little to no interruption. In other words, the fibers on the back need to be unviolated. With a natural back, you can use character staves loaded with bends and wiggles since the fibers across the back will share those same wiggles. But if you try to make a board bow out of characterful wood, and you cut across the wiggles indiscriminately, you'll violate the fibers and introduce runoff. With board bows, you're limited to wood with near-perfect straight grain. Since the board is sawn straight, you need fibers that are also straight, without runoff or violation. Know that you can use flat sawn or quarter sawn wood, or anything in between. Many excellent bowyers prefer to back board bows, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's absolute nonsense to say you must back a board bow, or that you need to only use certain growth ring orientations. As long as you choose a straight grain board with little enough runoff and little enough violation, you can absolutely make an unbacked bow. Arguably there are minor differences between flat and standing rings, and I won't get into them today. But the choice is not a make or break aspect of bow design. If your bow breaks or has issues, it wasn't the growth ring orientation, much more likely the wood selection, design, or tiller. Now that said, if your bow has certain minor issues like little pin knots or small amounts of violation, it can be preferable to use a flat sawn board. Personally, I prefer to avoid boards with that sort of issue in the first place though. The other big advantage of a flat sawn board is that if you find one with violated growth rings on the back, you may be able to chase a growth ring and perfectly rescue the board for a very strong back. All right, that's enough about board bows for now, but if you'd like to learn more about them, I do have a detailed, hour-long tutorial on the channel for a beginner-friendly board bow. Chapter 4, Decrowning. If you merge two of the previous methods, the natural back with the board bow approach, you get decrowning. The crown is another term for the curved surface on the outside of the tree. Low diameter staves like saplings will have a relatively high crown, while staves from large diameter trees will have a relatively flat crown. Decrowning is the act of flattening the crown on the back of the stave, so that it resembles the back of a board bow. This is almost the same thing as turning your stave into a board, except you'll be able to follow all of the bends and wiggles in the wood. In other words, much like a board bow, a decrowned bow has violated growth rings, but the net result is a back that is unviolated, because the fibers that run across the back will be entire and uninterrupted. Now all this begs the question of why you would even want to do this. The most common use of decrowning is as a precursor to adding a backing. We'll get to that in the chapter on backings. For now, let's stick to self bows. The issue with a high crown is that it concentrates the tension stress along the peak of the crown. In other words, the ridge along the center of the back does more than its fair share of work and the rest of the back is potentially dead weight. That's the argument anyway. I rarely ever find myself in a position where it's worth the trouble. Most of the wood species that I use are tension strong white woods, such as hickory, maple, ash elm, etc. These woods are so strong in tension that in most cases, it's hard for the belly of the bow to keep up. Many bowyers actually trap the back with these species. Trap being short for trapezoidal cross section. 
In other words, trapping is to narrow the back. This might seem counterintuitive if you've only just begun to make bows. In that case, tension safety tends to be the number one priority. Before you worry about performance, you need to make sure that your bow can stay in one piece. With a bit of experience designing and tailoring bows, tension safety stops being the primary concern in most builds. If you implement the methods in this video, you'll have a back that's plenty tension strong, and so the belly becomes the weak link in the design. When the wood gets overwhelmed, it begins to take set, and this primarily happens in the belly. So what we can often do to restore the balance and make sure the back isn't overwhelming the belly is to narrow the back, resulting in a trapezoidal cross-section. If you think about it, trapping and high crowns are conceptually very similar. They concentrate the tension force along a narrower strip of the back, resulting in a wider belly than back. So if trapping is advantageous for tension-strong whitewoods, then a high crown should at the very least be fine, and at best maybe even advantageous. Some of the very best wood I've used comes from small diameter stock with a high crown, and I almost never feel the need to decrown. I'm not saying that the practice of decrowning is nonsense, or that it should never be done. I just don't find it to be worth the risk most of the time, for most of the wood that I use. A pristine back is very valuable to me, and it's really, really hard to decrown to that same level of precision. It's absolutely true that decrowning can potentially increase tension safety, but keep in mind that this assumes you're skilled and patient enough to perform a perfect or near-perfect decrowning. Easier said than done. Personally, I find that decrowning makes the most sense as a precursor to a backing. Chapter 5. Backings So what do you do if your staver board doesn't have a clean strip of fibers across the back? If it's an otherwise good enough stave, you could chase a growth ring, but that's not always possible due to the growth ring orientation. The other option is to add a backing. Backings fall into three general categories. Soft backings, hard backings, and sinew, which deserves its own category. When you add a backing, you no longer have a self-bow. You're now dealing with a simple composite. For the most part, my interest in bow making revolves around self-bows. And personally, I find that adding a backing ruins the whole magic and poetry and wholesomeness of a self-bow. A bow made from one piece. A bow made from itself. If you ask me, the best backing is air. It adds no weight and lets the wood shine on its own. Now that's just my taste in bows, which is not what this video is about. So let's get to it. Soft backings. Functionally, bows with a soft backing are pretty much the same as a self bow, generally speaking. You can add a soft backing at any stage of the process while you're making a self bow, and it shouldn't massively change the design, function, or draw specs. Soft backings don't add a huge amount of tension safety. They just add a little bit of extra margin for error. They do, however, excel at protecting the back of the bow from scratches and dings. Rawhide is the quintessential soft backing. It's extremely tough, dries hard, and works well with hand tools. Plus, it can be applied with simple wood glue. Cloth is also a very popular backing choice because it's so widely available, and so many different cloths are useful for backing. My go-to recommendation is thick linen, but you can also use denim from old jeans, or just about any other tough cloth you find in sheets, old clothes, dress ties, etc. You can also apply cloth with wood glue. For an example of how to apply a cloth backing, but that also applies to any other soft backing, see chapter 6 of my board bow tutorial. When it comes to backings, there are many I recommend avoiding. Fiberglass cloth is a popular choice, but personally I don't recommend it because it's a pain to work with and it's so rigid that it can overwhelm the belly of the bow and exacerbate set. In my opinion, wood bows don't mix well with fiberglass. If you're going to back a bow with fiberglass, you may as well make a proper fiberglass bow with fiberglass on the back and the belly. In this case, the wood is pretty much just making up the core, and the fiberglass is doing the bow part. A wood belly can't stand up that well to a fiberglass backing. There are also a few backings gaining popularity that I consider to be fun gimmicks for entertainment value, but not actually worth using. Just because they can be used doesn't mean they're doing much useful work. These include fiberglass drywall tape and rawhide from dog chews. Fiberglass drywall tape is increasing in popularity as a backing choice. It's not very good looking, and doesn't even offer much in the way of protection. 
Often it's applied in more than one layer, leading to sloppy craftsmanship, and meaning that there are now multiple glue lines to fail, rather than just one. I'm obviously going hard against drywall tape, in part because of taste, but it's also just a lousy backing. Most types of cloth will look much better, and offer the same protection, without the risk that fiberglass has of overwhelming the belly. Another popular choice that I recommend avoiding is rawhide from dog chews. Not all rawhide is ideal for bow making. You want thin stuff that has only been dried, not exposed to heat, and not tanned into leather. Rawhide for dog chews is way too thick and heavy, plus it's been cooked, making it bubbly and porous, and much weaker. Worst of all is that frequently dog chews come in small strips, so you may have to overlap several pieces per limb. This stuff bears very little relation to proper bow making rawhide, and I see no reason to use it over whatever other cloth you probably already have lying around. Next up are hard backings. I'll only gloss over this because now we're really getting away from the sort of bows I make. The difference with a hard backing is that you can't just add one whenever you want. You use a hard backing to assemble the stave or the bow blank that you'll start off with. Hard backings are typically very thin strips of wood or bamboo, pressed and laminated onto either a core or the belly wood. If I talk too much more about hard backings, I'll definitely overextend my knowledge. This isn't the type of bow that I make. Finally, there is one more type of backing. Sinew. In some ways, it's like a soft backing. It's soft when you apply it, and can take the shape of the back of the bow. You can also apply a thin layer of sinew at any point in the construction without massively changing the design. A lot like a soft backing. Thicker layers, however, will have a big impact, like a hard backing. And also like a hard backing, sinew will dry to almost a concrete hardness. As sinew dries after being applied, it shrinks and pulls the bow into reflex. This moves the neutral plane of the bow closer to the back. The neutral plane is the strip in between the back and the belly, which is neither under tension nor compression, but in a neutral state. When you bend any piece of wood, the back will go into tension and the belly into compression, and the two forces go into an equilibrium state, with the neutral plane being the frontier between them. When you add a backing, particularly sinew, the neutral plane moves closer to the back of the bow, because not as much wood is needed along the back, now that a backing has been added. The surprising and interesting effect of moving the neutral plane closer to the back of the bow is that this leaves more material on the belly side of the neutral plane, effectively making the bow better able to handle compression. Counterintuitively, adding a backing has strengthened both the back and the belly. Chapter 6. The Violated Back I've said that you want your bow to have a clean strip of fibers that goes straight across the back without interruptions. That's not always realistic. Now, in most situations, I don't actually recommend a violated back. This chapter is about the exception to the rule, about how much you can get away with, and how much we have in the past. Not all historical bow finds have had chased ring backs. Many had violated backs, most notoriously the highly esteemed English longbow there's not always time to chase every last ring. And it may not even be a realistic goal for woods with very tight growth rings. The key is keeping the violations to a reasonable amount. You still want to avoid as much violation as is practical to avoid. With some woods, you can get away with a lot, and it's pretty common practice to blatantly violate the back of the bow. There should still be some effort to follow the general lay of the fibers, though, but it's not strictly necessary to get it exactly right. Yew wood, for example, can take an incredible amount of violation, and it seems to suffer less from violation than other woods do. Bowyers frequently say that you can violate you, but you can't violate Osage. Really, there's a continuum between the two. You can violate anything, somewhat. You wood can just take more violation than other woods. Many tension-strong woods such as hickory and elm are also notorious for surviving violation on the back. This seems to be a property of many other close-grained woods as well. For instance, juniper is often given the same treatment as you would. Yet, it also has a reputation for being brittle in tension, and exploding unexpectedly. I often wonder if this reputation has anything to do with the popular advice that it's okay to violate the back of a juniper bow. While a violated back is historically accurate, or good enough in many instances, I still try as much as I can to chase a single growth ring in these circumstances. These days, prime yew wood is much more valuable than it used to be. So I think the balance of things is that 
It's more worthwhile nowadays for a bowyer to spend a little extra time on violating the back, a little less, and trying to get that ring chased as well as possible. All right, at this point we've covered all of the major methods for preparing the back of your bow. So now let's walk you through this decision tree so you can decide what to do with your own staves. Welcome back. I hope the video has been helpful so far. Now I'm going to tie everything together and I'll walk you through this decision tree. So hopefully you can decide what to do with whatever stave you have. All right, so you've got some sort of bow stave. Is it a split stave, a sapling, or a board? We'll start with the split staves. The first thing you want to ask yourself is what part of the wood you want to use. You may need a little bit of prior knowledge for that, or to do a little bit of Googling. Feel free to ask me in the comments what part that is depending on the species you're using. For the most part, you're going to have your whitewoods, your heartwoods, and woods where you have a desirable heartwood-sapwood combo. For example, oak or yew. There's also the situation where you have a damaged back. We'll get to that in a little bit. We'll start with the whitewoods. Most of the time with the whitewoods, as long as you have a healthy back, you can use a natural back. There's no need to chase a growth ring. If you're using a natural back, the main consideration is whether the bark is stuck or if the bark slips off. Now there are some woods, for example yew, where the bark will pop off when you're tillering. For the most part, that's the exception to the rule, and you can also treat yew just like it's a normal wood. In general, in the winter, the bark is going to be stuck, and in the summer, the bark is going to slip off. You can get winter wood to act like summer wood by steaming the stave, throwing it in a hot shower, or adding some boiling water to the back of the bark, and that'll get the bark to slip off just like it's summer. In the winter, when the bark is stuck, you're going to have to carefully remove the outer bark with a draw knife, and then scrape the inner bark with a scraper. One thing to add is if you peel the bark off in the summertime, it's a good idea to seal the back of the stave with some wood glue or some wood sealer. All right, that covers the natural back and what you want to do for white wood such as hickory, ash, maple, elm, hazel, etc. Now let's talk about the heartwoods, for example, uh, osage or mulberry. Generally with those, you're going to want to chase a growth ring. You don't strictly have to chase a growth ring, if the wood's been dried, kind of like it's a white wood, and there's absolutely no rot in the sapwood, you can use a natural back and you can use the sapwood for the back of the bow. But in general, with woods like Osage, you're going to want to chase a growth ring down to the heartwood. There are also woods where you want a combo of sapwood and heartwood on the back. That's very common with you. And in that case, you want to chase a sapwood ring or try to chase a sapwood ring as well as you can with you. If you're using oak, you want to perfectly chase a sapwood ring as well as you can manage. Now, there's also the case where there's some damage to the back of the stave, or some rot, or some bug damage, or spalting, or maybe the tree fell and dented itself. In that case, you might need to chase a growth ring. You can chase a sapwood ring if it's a white wood. If it's a heartwood, you may need to chase a heartwood ring anyway. All right, so overall, the situations where you'll be chasing a growth ring are if you're using a heartwood, and the heartwood's desirable, if you want a combo of heartwood and sapwood, if there's damage to the back, or if you make a mistake, then you may want to chase a growth ring, or back the bow, or allow the mistake to be and go with a violated back, but I don't always recommend that. There is one more case if you're using a board bow, and you have a flats on board that is otherwise not good enough to use, but can be salvaged by chasing a growth ring, and then you'll pretty much have a natural stave. Okay, let's move on to number three, the violated back. As I said before, this method is the exception to the rule. It's sort of how much you can get away with. So I recommend using this approach as little as possible. So as much as you have the attention span to chase a perfect growth ring, you should try to do that, even for woods like you and Juniper, where they say it's okay to violate the back. It's still going to be better if you can perfectly chase a growth ring and you'll have a stronger back if you do that. You can sort of think of the violated back on a U English longbow as an attempt to chase a growth ring with some allowable controlled mistakes. Now you can get to a violated back from pretty much any spot on this decision tree, which I'm trying to represent here. You know, if you have a board bow that's not very good, that's a violated back. If you mess up 
taking the bark off, you have a violated back. All that you may be able to get away with, it's just not advisable. All right, number four, backing. Kind of like the violated back, you can back a bow out of any of these situations. So we'll talk about backings a little bit more as it comes up. Let's go ahead to saplings before we talk about decrowning. So a lot of bowyers will tell you that if you use a sapling with a high crown, that's a, a very tight radius on the back, that you're going to need to decrown it. I think that that depends a little bit on whether you have a tension strong wood or not. So if you're dealing with a white wood, most of those are going to be very tension strong and they don't really suffer from a high crown. So personally, with most of the woods that I use, I'm perfectly comfortable using a natural back on a sapling without decrowning. You also have a, a big advantage with the natural back, which is that you're not going to make a mistake. And from that, you have a little bit more integrity. So there are big bonuses to not decrowning if you can avoid it. It is more common to decrown for woods like Osage and Yew, which are not as relatively tension strong as something like Hickory. All right, let's move on to boards. As I said before, you want to choose a straight grain board with unviolated fibers all the way across the back as much as you can. See the board selection diagram for more details about that. In general, if you have a good enough board, you can just use a sawn back. That's an unbacked back on your board bow. If you don't have a good enough board and it's almost good enough, you might be able to salvage it by backing. But I don't really recommend using bad boards with a backing. There's a big gray area and a lot of judgment call to that. In general, look for as perfect a board as you can manage. Um, the less perfect your board, the more unexpected the break will be. All right, that's it. Let me know down in the comments if you have any more questions. I know this was a lot, so I will post pictures to all of these diagrams down in the description of the video. All right, this has been the back of the bow, six different ways. I hope this was useful and I hope this helps with your current bow or your next one. If you have any questions, find me in the comments and I'll get to them. If you have in-depth questions, find me on r slash bowyer on Reddit. That's pretty much the fastest way to reach me. Um, if you have anything to add, please add, add that in the comments. If you have corrections, uh, please feel free uh, to put them down there too. And um, thank you so much to everyone who supports this channel. Thank you to my cousin for his amazing music. You can find him on Instagram. You can listen to his music on Spotify for free. Uh, you can buy his albums on iTunes. Please go and do that. And uh, just thank you so much for all of your feedback. It's been amazing to see uh, the bows you guys have made following the board bow tutorial. Uh, that's been really cool. Um, all right, that's all for today. This was the back of the bow, six ways. May your arrows fly true. I'll see you next time.